Hello, and welcome to Maine's model of school supports, tier three identified schools with no support in FY22-23 cohort two. This recording is taking place in July of 2024, and it's being presented by the Continuous School Improvement Program. Hello, again, my name is Monique Sullivan and I am the Continuous School Improvement Coordinator for the Maine Department of Education. Although I am listed under ESEA, I work with the assessment team under Maine's model of school supports, which falls under several sections of the ESSA statute, but specifically Title I, Section 1111 and Section 1003. Before getting started with the content of this recording, I wanted to just quickly go over the mission and the vision and the strategic priorities of the Maine Department of Education. These are the driving forces behind all the work that we do at the department. The outcomes for this recording are to understand identification status, understand how to access and review school profiles, understand requirements of tier three CSI school improvement plans and next steps for the 2024-2025 school year. Again, this is a recording for those schools that were identified in 2022 and 2023. Notification letters were sent in May of 2023, notifying these schools and their SAUs that they had been identified as newly identified for tier three supports. So the next three slides, I'm going to talk about the identification cycle, exit and notifications. Maine's model of school support is run every year, but identifications are made every year for tier two TSI, every three years for tier three CSI, and every six years for tier one ATSI. Schools remain in identified status until exit criteria is met or conversion to another status happens. Typically, the cycle is three years because it takes three years to be able to meet the exit criteria to exit uh, identification status. Schools may also convert to another status within those three years. So first I wanted to go over the, the tiered identification uh, statuses that there were in FY22-23. And typically the department would not make identifications back to back uh, in 22 and 23. And then we made them again additionally in 23-24. But per, USD, per USDOE directive, um, the department was required to make back to back identifications. So in 22-23, in school year 2022, school year 2023, there were um, seven uh, identification statuses that were made. There were tier three that were labeled as not able to exit. And these were schools that continue to receive tier three supports in FY23-24. There were 49 of them. And although they did not meet the criteria for tier three identification per USDO directive, uh, we were not, the department was not allowed to exit anyone from tier three status. Um, so those 49 schools continued into, uh, continued in tier three support status and received tier three support. Uh, there were also tier three schools. There were 20 of them that were re-identified and they continued to receive tier three supports in FY23 and 24. And these were the schools that um, when the model was run again, they still met the tier three requirements they were considered to be within the 5% according to the Maine's Model School Supports Plan, and they did receive uh, tier three supports, and this identification cycle is for three years. Then we also had tier three, newly identified. Uh, they met the tier three exit criteria, and um, they met the exit, they, sorry, they met the tier three identification criteria, but were provided no tier three supports because they were outside the 5% per Maine's model of school supports plan. They were newly identified. They were not identified as tier three in FY 2018 and 19, um, and therefore they were not getting the, the extra tier three support. 
This is the group that you that this recording is for is number three, the tier three newly identified or outside the 5% um, but are still considered to be tier three schools. This is what this recording is going to focus on. But just for more information, there were 86 schools that were identified for tier two. There were um, 77 that were I get tier one, but just like with the tier threes, there were some that were not able to exit per USDOE directive. And there's tier one that were newly identified uh, that had not been identified in 1819 and were identified for tier one in uh, 2223. And then there were also schools that um, were identified in 1819 for tier one and continued to meet tier one identification criteria in 2223 and are considered re-identified. And there are 37 of those. Notifications were mailed to SAUs in May of 2023. So how to find, if you wanna be able to find that information, the, um, the documents that were uh, mailed to SAUs in May of 2023, you can go to the FY24 ESEA consolidated application you would go to the SAU documents library, you'd go to general, ESEA documents, main models of school support, and there you should have all of the notifications, the school profiles and the notification letters that were sent to the SAU um, back in May of 2023. Moving forward to FY23-24, um, again, Typically, the department would not make back-to-back -back identifications, but per US DOE directive, um, the department uh, did make back-to-back -back identifications. So um, there were several tier, the tier three that I mentioned in the previous slide that were could not exit. Uh, moving forward to 23-24, they were able to exit, there were 13 of them, and they exited with no support. They had no student groups that were experiencing challenges, so they exited clear and free. There were tier three that were able to exit tier three status because they didn't have all their student populations experiencing challenges, but they still had at least one student group uh, experiencing challenges, and there were 23 of those. There were, uh, of those, 49 here, there were actually 13 that did not meet the exit criteria. They still had all their student populations experiencing challenges across all indicators, and therefore they were unable to exit, and there were 13 of them. So they will continue into tier three status until they can exit. And then uh, there were tier three that we labeled as not able to exit or eligible, not eligible to exit with support, um, and there were 20, and then without support 27. And those were the schools that were in um, the two re-identified and the three newly identified, which again is number four is uh, without support is the group, is the recording, is the audience for this recording. So you were identified as nearly identified in 2223. You didn't get support because you were outside the 5%, um, but it is, you, you, you still have to finish with that cycle. And so you have, um, you haven't, you're not eligible to meet, you're not eligible to exit because you haven't done the years and you ha you don't have the exit criteria yet. And then tier three, uh, there were 18 new schools that were identified with uh, for supports because they were within the 5%. Um, and uh, those were the schools that were still meeting the tier three identification criteria. And then um, lastly, tier three, uh, number six, uh, met the criteria in 23-24, but were outside the 5%, and there were 29 of them, no support. So similar to you, uh, this group, they were identified for the similar status in 23-24 as this recording audience was record, uh, was identified in 22-23. And then seven, tier two, uh, those 86 that we identified 22-23 are still not eligible to exit, so they're still tier, still tier two. And then tier one able to exit, we had 35 tier ones that were able to exit of the uh, schools that were listed um, in the previous slide. And then um, we had tier one that were newly identified last or uh, re-identified last year for tier one. And so they're not eligible to exit. There are 55 of those. Um, there were some schools that were eligible to exit, that's nine, but they were unable to exit because they did not meet the exit criteria, which were 69. 
And then lastly, we had tier one, which are identified in FY22-23, newly identified, um, and they there are 36 of them. So there is a combination between being eligible, there's a difference between being able to exit and being eligible to exit. So you may not be eligible to exit because the school just doesn't have enough years of data to meet the exit criteria. And then being able to exit means you have enough years to meet the exit criteria for years, and then a school may not be able to exit because they haven't met the uh, exit criteria. Now, again, these schools were identified in 2022-23. Uh, we're considering them as cohort two because this is the second time that we made identifications. The first time under this model was in FY 18 and 19. Due to COVID and changing the assessment, um, the second identification didn't happen until 2022-2023, which notifications were sent out in May of 2023. Typically, tier three status is for three years because um, the exit criteria almost requires a three-year cycle. And so these schools were, uh, the audience for this for this recording identified as tier three with no support. Um, the label was newly identified last year. We changed that this year to, to reflect more of the support level. And when we say no support, there's no section 1033 funds that are awarded to these schools because they're outside of 5% as, as determined in statute and means model of school supports, which is our state accountability plan. And this plan is available on the Maine Department of Education's website if you want to read it. Um, all populations are experiencing challenges or emerging across all indicators, and that's what merits the uh, tier three identification status. Um, Note that eligible to exit tier three status after three years, uh, because you need, for the exit criteria, you need to not, you'd have to have not meeting identif criteria, identification criteria for two years. And it takes three years to be able to do that. So you have options, the school will have options when they get to that, when they get to the ability to el eligible to exit, they can exit tier three status with no support. That means that no student populations are experiencing challenges or emerging across all indicators. A school can exit tier three status, but enter into tier one uh, ATSI support uh, because at least one student population is experiencing challenges across indicators. And they can also convert to tier three status with tier three support. Um, they're unable to exit tier three status because all student populations are experiencing challenges across all indicators. School profiles. So all of the public facing information um, regarding student accountability means model school support is on the ESSA dashboard. Um, and when you go to that, you'll be able to see that. Now, we also provided, um, and I will provide this in the, when I upload this to YouTube and then send out the notification, uh, we will provide a link for schools, a web link for schools with a password so that schools can go in and, and see their actual school profiles. The ESSA dashboard, we only have posted what's required in state statute, I'm sorry, in federal statute. But this, what I'm showing on this screen is actually drills down a little bit more, gives you a little more information. Doesn't drill down to the student level, but it actually gives me more information about the student populations that rendered the identification status. And I will um, provide that in the notification when this recording is available along with the slide deck. So when you get this website, this uh, dashboard that was created for schools, there's no personally identifying information. It just has more information that is required on the uh, public facing ESSA dashboard. So there's a school profile, there's an end count, there's graphs, uh, there's identification over time, there's achievement goals, and there's a map. So school profiles, um, sometimes it can be a little difficult to understand this. But this is a formula, and it's not just one factor that renders the identification status. There are several um, factors that go into play. Um, this top part is what's on the ESSA dashboard, the public facing one. And just looking across, you can see that, OK, this was the first part of the equation. Moving along, they did the school did well with academic uh, ELA. So this is not what rendered the status. But if you look at the two reds over here in the academic, I mean, in the map, this is what rendered 
the status. And this part will be on the public facing as a dashboard. The bottom part is not. This is what's located on the web uh, link that we will that I will provide in the notification on grants for me. But the way you need to do this is just go through the formula. So chronic absenteeism, and to note, chronic absenteeism is what's reported by the SAU. Uh, the U.S. I mean, the main Department of Education takes that information and they input that into the accountability model. It is what is reported by the SAU. Whatever the SAU reports, that's what gets um, entered into this part of the accountability model. So if a district um, reports 5% chronic absenteeism or 50% chronic absenteeism, it is what is reported by the SAU. Uh, if you're looking across here, you can see that um, all student populations rendered this status because first, all of the student populations, economically disadvantaged students with disabilities and white students, all had more than, had 10% or more chronic absenteeism. So if you go down here to the, here, then this is the first, this is the first um, part of the formula. And so then we move across. And we see, oh, economically disadvantaged. Okay, they didn't meet this part of the equation, but it's or. So then we move to the math, and yes, they had both two reds here for economically disadvantaged. So this group experiencing challenges. Then we go to students with disabilities, chronic absenteeism. They're doing really well in ELA. So this isn't what rendered it, but their math, two reds. So this students with disabilities is. Uh, experiencing challenges. And then the white population, um, they, again, chronic absenteeism, yes. Um, ELA, no, because they didn't have two reds, but they did have two reds in the math. So if you look at this, all three other student populations uh, rendered the, uh, the tier three identification status. And then here's just another example for high school. Um, and this is actually a, a, a school that spans uh, both grade levels. So the US Department of Education has two grade spans, pre-K eight and nine, 12. So if you are, if a school is a seven, 12 school, then they will get um, the accountability model will account for both the pre-K eight and the seven um, and the nine, 12, because it spans both. Um, and as you can see across, um, there were all they, there were there's lots of reds here in the uh, math and in the uh, the graduation rate. So this uh, school was identified for both at the elementary level and also at the high school level. There's also an end count, uh, just to give you an idea of how many students are participating in this. Um, the school improvement won't really focus on the participation rate, but the assessment team will because the U.S. Department of Education has started to flag those schools that are not meeting the 95% attendant um, participation rate. The next one is graphs. So you can look at the graphs if some people really think that looks um, easier to look at and see trends. Then there's the achievement goals and the achievement goals. Um, so the school profiles that are posted those are based on a state average for our achievement growth because the, the main three assessment was recalibrated. So they had to have a baseline somewhere. So the baseline is state averages for the school profiles. But the achievement goals are based on the actual school's um, data. So the percentages may be a little bit off. The numbers may be a little off because this is actually based on the school where the school profile and the accountability model for um, FY24 was based on the state average. Moving forward, it will be based on schools' individual data. And then we wanted to provide some help with schools to understand the identification. So for particular in this school, they were not identified as tier three in 2018-2019, which is the first identification year that we had. Due to COVID, we didn't make identifications. And then 21-22 um, was COVID, but it was also we had a new assessment and therefore um, we didn't make identifications. But in 22, 23, we did, this school was newly identified. 
um, moving to 23, 24, they had a no for meeting tier three, but you need two consecutive no's to be able to exit tier three status. And then you can also see they were tier one because the way the model works is that everyone who's a tier three is also a tier one, but we default to the highest level identification um, when, we, when we make the identification status. And then lastly, there's a map here for if you wanna see how, how other schools are in the state, where there are other tier ones, where there are other tier twos, just to give you an idea of where the identified schools are around the state. And then the school improvement plan, um, these are the requirements and for monitoring. So um, these again are schools that were identified in 22-23 as newly identified for tier three because they were outside the, um, the 5%. That means they were not uh, identified in 1819. They were originally, they were newly identified in 22-23. They're still tier three but because tier three schools are also tier one schools, all schools identified as tier three with no section 1003 funds support will be required to complete tier one ATSI requirements for their school improvement plans. You can see Maine's model school support plan for the hierarchy of identification status. This is the plan I was talking about. This is available on the Maine's Department of Education. Um, and then we're gonna talk out on the next slides about what those plan requirements are. So just real quickly, the requirements are set forth in the ESSA section, ESSA statute section 1111, little d, two, and then big C. And then it talks about a plan described in subparagraph B, which I will talk about on the next slide. And then you, uh, the plan needs to identify resource inequities. And also the plan needs to address those identified resource inequities in the plan. So the plan needs to address those. And then in section 1111, little d, two big B, uh, these are what needs to be included in the plan. Uh, the plan needs to be developed with uh, stakeholders, specific ones, principals, other leaders, teachers, and parents. It needs to uh, develop and implement a school level targeted support and improvement plan to in prove the student outcomes based on the indicators in the statewide accountability system. So when you look at your school profile, when you drill down to some of your NWA and um, Acacia data, then you'll build that plan around that. It needs to include um, evidence-based interventions, at least one needs to be approved by the SAU, monitored by the SAU, and the SAU needs to provide more support if plan doesn't work. So in summary, um, the school must develop a plan that is reviewed and approved by the school and the SAU. It needs to be in developed with partnership with stakeholders, it needs to be informed by all the indicators in the main state accountability system, and it needs to include at least one or more evidence-based interventions. Now, that being said, um, if the tier, if the school is already a school-wide program, if it already operates a Title I school-wide program, there already is a school-wide plan in place because that is required to be able to operate a school-wide Title I school-wide program. So rather than recreate or create a new school improvement plan, schools can use their already school-wide plan that's already in existence and just make sure that it's updated and includes all the SI plan requirements. Now, if the school operates a operates a targeted Title I program, they may not have a school-wide plan, but their district has to. Their SAU is required to have an SAU CNA. And in that SAU CNA, the, uh, it, there needs to be an identification of all the schools and what the CNA and what the district is doing to address the needs, identify needs in those schools. So as long as that SAU CNA um, includes the school improvement identified schools and has all the SI plan requirements, then that should be sufficient. If um, And no school can be identified tier three um, unless they're operating at either a targeted or a title one or school-wide program. Now, all documentation needs to be kept at the school site. Nothing needs to be submitted to the main DOE unless requested. And just as a note, school improvement will be included in the FY24 ESCA monitoring. So if 
your SAU happens to be monitored in FY2425, then you will be asked to submit your SI plan or school improvement plans for any identified schools, any tier one, any tier two, and any tier three identified schools. And then lastly, what I'm asking is because there's not really an easy way to send out information to um, these tier three schools um, that, that were identified but have no support. They don't have a SIG application. So um, the LEA tier three principal no support role was added into the address book for the ESA consolidated application. Uh, what I'm asking is in the FY25 application, ESA consolidated application, application, if you can have your user access administrator go in and set the tier three school principals with this role, the LEA tier three principal no support role, if you can have that role set for them, then I any information that I send, I'll do through Grants for Me notification system. For example, this recording and the slide deck and any other accompanying um, documentation will be sent through Grants for Me. So if you can set that role up, that would be much appreciated. Um, it, this screen, it has been set up, so it should be all set for um, your user administrator to assign those roles to your tier three school principals, the ones without support. The ones with support already have a SIG application, so that communication has already been set up. And that is it. Um, these are resources and opportunities. Um, and then there's the professional development calendar, which you can go on and see that. I did want to stress that um, all identified schools will receive, can attend or participate in Maine sponsored or Maine Department of Education sponsored uh, professional development at no cost. At no cost means registration fees will be covered. Um, any other travel costs like lodging or meals or mileage or salary uh, reimbursement for outside of contracted hours needs to be covered with, a with other funds. And lastly, our contact information. Um, the best way to get a hold of me is to send me an email. If you want to chat via phone, I will set up an appointment um, with you, set up a calendar date, or we can set up a Zoom account. I'm much better with that than um, leaving voicemails or cold calling me. Um, and then Tyra has, if you have questions about any of the financial pieces, and then Jeanette is the, um, the chief of federal programs. And then last, if you want to stay connected to, with the Maine Department of Education, here are all the different ways that you can do that. And, um, and thank you and reach out to me if you have any questions uh, regarding tier three status for schools that were identified in 22-23. For tier three, it was labeled newly identified. We've changed that to now with no support. Thank you.